Glad to be here. I'm Robert Murphy. I am uh, an economist. I got my degree from NYU. I was in academia for a while. I taught at Hillsdale College and I did research at Texas Tech under what was called the Free Market Institute. And I, the two main posts I have just to round out the discussion for tonight, I'm a senior fellow with the Mises Institute. They're the organization for which I wrote the Law Without the State essay. And uh, also, I am the chief economist for Infinio, which is a tech company, and we're doing things like taking life insurance and putting it on the blockchain. I won't pretend to to understand how all that works, but I've heard of it, so I know it's, it must be real. Well, yeah, that is, that's that's good. Well, so that Law Without the State article, I guess, I know it's published on Mises back in 2011, so I probably read it within a year or two after that was published. Um, but it got me thinking in terms of how there could be a private solution for government problems. Like if the, if the post office does a bad job, well, it just gets more money. But if it were a private business and it started doing a bad job, it'd go broke and somebody would come in and replace it. So I found it really helpful in terms of like getting my wheels turning, um, especially with the insurance angle. Um, you know, if, if somebody, uh, is a bad driver, their insurance rates go up. Well, you could just apply that same concept to, um, somebody's likelihood to commit a crime or, or things like that. I just thought it was a really creative way to, to go about defining the, the problem and a potential solution. Yeah. So this is, and this is why a few minutes ago, besides just, you know, plugging my main client as it were, but I mentioned that I'm in my sort of my like day job role, I'm working at a financial company because the, those, my two worlds have come together. When I was in grad school, I wrote what's called uh, chaos theory, this pamphlet. And one of the essays was private law. It's not, I don't think it's the exact article you're talking about. This was, was earlier, but, um, and it's, uh, and yeah, the, what the thing that I did in there that I think was an innovation is I, I had, uh, I said in a, in a private society, insurance contracts would play a big role. And so then now the fact that, you know, right now I'm also the chief economist at a company where we're doing a lot with insurance. Like I'm seeing how, the stuff that I wrote about theoretically in grad school and a few years afterward, like, Hey, at some point we can imagine it was almost like a science fiction thing. And now actually it's going to be a lot more plausible, even without half the population reading Rothbard and, you know, seeing, having an epiphany, but to, to return to the idea. Yeah. The idea is that we I mean, right now, um, a doctor at a hospital, you go to get a surgery, the, um, they have medical malpractice insurance. If you want to drive on the road legally, at least you have to have insurance for liability that if you hurt somebody else, you you know, you, you're at fault and somebody else's car gets totaled or gets injured because of your reckless driving. You need to have insurance in place to pay them, not just to pay you to fix your own car. So this isn't some crazy idea of people having insurance in force that makes the rest of the community more willing to interact with them. Right. Like you'd be afraid to go get a surgery at a reputable hospital if they said, yeah, there's a sign buyer beware. If, you know, if he kills you on the table, your, your heirs get nothing. So that idea made me think, well, why couldn't we just extend that? And so yeah, in a voluntary society where there's, you know, there's no state taxing authority claiming a monopoly on the use of lawful violence or the determination of when it's lawful or not. Um, Still, I think that would play a, a big role with, in like a Western type capitalist society where before somebody hired somebody, before you could rent a car, before you could rent an apartment, certainly moving into a neighborhood within HOA, that kind of thing, you would have to have insurance in place. So in other words, there's some third party company vouching for you and they would only do that if they knew a bit about you. And then of course you pay higher premiums if you get into bar fights all the time. And so I think it would just, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop here. There's obviously a, I wrote a whole essay on this stuff, so I'll stop and let you just take it where you want. But that, that's the basic idea. I think they would be a lot more peaceful and people would get immediate, more immediate feedback on their behavior because the people vouching for you, if you screwed up and committed crimes, they're on the hook for it financially. Whereas right now, this is the last thing I'll say, just to contrast the two systems and the accountability right now, some guy, you know, kills somebody and then he's in, in jail for 10 years and comes up for parole if the parole board lets them out because they think, ah, he seems like he's reformed and he goes and kills somebody else, they certainly don't have to pay a $500,000 fine. The people who let him out, it's, you know, oops, sorry. So whereas in my system, 
but but on the other hand, people wouldn't you it wouldn't just be locking people up forever because these are productive people. They could, you know what I mean? There would be win-win exchanges where it's kind of pointless to have productive people just sitting in cells doing nothing for 10 years. And so I think the interaction of all those incentives would just in a voluntary private property framework would minimize crime, but also not like just throw people away and forget about them. Right. And it would also be, you know, depending on the risk, it would be, there would be balances like, okay, well, is it murder or is it, you know, grand theft auto, or is it like petty larceny? There'd be, there'd be degrees of how you deal with things. It's not just like a sledgehammer, throw away the key, you know, type approach. And if, if you don't mind me, Adam, unveiling it here for the first time ever, like this is just ideas have been ruminating. I haven't written this up yet, but now what, what I'm seeing, what's possible with technology, my views are shifting a little bit. I think it's that, yeah, like if you were some newcomer, like let's say there's the, you know, the anarcho-capitalist country, so maybe it's an island, right? And so strangers are just showing up every day because, you know, wages are high there. You can really get a job easily because it's, you know, there's no government regulation, that kind of stuff. Um, but so people are showing up, but you know, no one knows who they are at first. If they're not coming, you know, through, they've got to establish some kind of trust or something. I mean, basically what you're talking about is a way to like an alternative form of identification, right? Like if you've got a criminal record and somebody swipes your ID, all that stuff, you know, that you're at risk for shows up, which is basically what you're trying to solve for. Right. And so. I think, you know, the way they would handle it is just to say, like, it would be understood that the various property owners on that island or whatever would just say to be walking around free, like if it's a mall or whatever, to walk around freely here or to get on our roads, like, yeah, some someone needs to be vouching. You need to have, like, a policy in place. And with, you know, here with, like, smartphones and apps and dot, dot, dot and everything, it'd be a lot easier to do this all seamlessly. You know, you just hold your phone up or whatever. Um, and... And, and you could have your own policy too. Like, so you could be paying into this insurance thing. It's sort of like posting a bond or something. It's maybe the way that people think about it. I'm thinking of insurance because that's, so you're making these payments and building it up. And then no, if you but never yeah, have it's to pay the same out, thing. It's like making sure this person's not yeah. going to skip town or go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just paying, you know, like it's sort of like, I picture it mentally, like you've got this like force field around you and other people do too. And for you to engage in commerce, like you can pledge all right, I'm willing to say if some, you know, arbitrator decides that I wronged you, I will pay up to $10,000. So do you want to deal with me for this, you know, I'm selling you my lawnmower or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And for more intimate, you know, long-term, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about hiring you as a full-time employee. I want you to pledge up to $300,000 in coverage in case, you know, you get caught stealing stuff or you assault another employee on the on the job. And so that's, and, and yeah, so like people can pay into it and build up their own buffer. And then if they never get convicted of something, you know, that's just theirs and they can give it to their kids or whatever. But that's kind of how I'm picturing it working that people are their willingness to post collateral to engage in interactions with each other. And now with the with smart contracts and stuff, it's it's easier to do that where you're not having to trust some third party. So even if the, there is no government there to enforce it, no, you're po putting it up in smart contracts and you know, if it's, if it's objectively verifiable criteria and that, you know, so, th so there's still quirks to it and everything, and it could be, the system could be gained, but I just think there's a lot of things that could happen where there would be like rule enforcement. I'm not even going to call it laws, just rule of like people agreeing ahead of time. This is how we're going to interact. You know, whether it's, we're going to play a football game and let's agree on what is, what counts as a touchdown and how many points is it versus, you know, we're going to, I'm going to rent this car from you and what law, what law, code are we stipulating is going to guide our interaction you know what i mean because there'd be different law codes floating around so it, at first it sounds like that couldn't work but you know the the, the current system's kind of crazy too where we say let's just one group of people have all the guns and all the cages and everything and just let them decide and we'll have popularity contests every two or four years to swap the people in and out who like run that system like that's kind of a nutty system too from a Darwinian perspective, like all politicians really have to do is be good at getting reelected. Everything they do has to get filtered through that lens if mm -hmm. they're just going to be successful. Well, it's basically you want some kind of shorthand way. You bring up a, you bring up a point in the article, um, where like if somebody goes into a movie theater and then commits a crime while he's in the movie theater, 
there would have been some kind of agreement, you know, when he bought the ticket or he entered this person's property that if armed men have to come and arrest me and they damage your property and I'm going to hold you harmless and blah, blah, blah. Now, all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, I think that's the, the draw for having a society ruled by the state. The draw is that it takes care of all of those simple interactions where mm -hmm. you don't have to state, you know, like you don't have to literally plop down a pile of paperwork in front of somebody so that they can get a movie ticket, you know, where it's all just shorthand ways of doing things. And if there's a problem, then you there's this process. But I hope you never have to use it just because it's so frustrating to use. Right. So I think with a lot, my views have shifted a little bit probably since, excuse me, wrote that. Yeah, I think now it, it's, you know, the default would just be if there's a dispute, we, we go to, you know, some arbitrator or maybe they would call him a judge. And that would always need to be decided in advance before something happens, which is I think that's that's a great reason for the insurance analogy, because you buy insurance before something happens, not after. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it, it would matter. It would depend too. like if we're talking about some small town where everybody has lived there for 30 years. A lot of stuff would be understood, whereas if it's a more, you know, urban area and people are coming and going from other places where cultural norms might be different. Yeah, I think stuff would be more explicitly spelled out than that. Like if you entered a movie theater, you know, I don't, I don't it would probably be like, like, you know, how if you rent a car, there's a bunch of like contract stuff that you just scroll through and sign your name at the bottom. And you don't even read it. I think there would be stuff like that, where technically you were agreeing by buying a movie ticket, like you say, yes. I agree that I'm going to abide by the ACME standard rules of conduct as laid out in the most recent digest, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so but I, I think it would just become perfunctory and people wouldn't even really pay attention to it. But I think technically that's what would be happening in terms of getting consent. And so like that, that's the way in which there, it would be a voluntary society. And yet if somebody stepped out of line, you know, people could come in and grab them. So have you gotten a contradiction? Have you gotten much feedback from that article or other things like it where obviously, like you mentioned, the smart contracts thing is sort of providing an avenue for that. Is that's can you tell me a little bit more about that that development? About the smart contract part or about the the feedback? The um well, I guess that is two questions. Um I guess the smart contract part of it. Uh, and I guess, did you have any people giving you that type of feedback? Like, Hey, actually this is a good idea. And by the way, there's this technology that, uh, Oh, okay. So, so no, the, the smart contract stuff is, is my own. And that was more, more of a recent thing. Like just the stuff we were doing at my work. Like I realized, Oh wait, this has implications. We might be able to put into practice some of the stuff I've thought about before. Um, also what it was is cause I, I had Dave Smith on the, the human action podcast and that sparked, I've been in the immigration debate, you know, from a Rothbardian framework for the last two weeks. And then I went and re-listened to an episode I had done on immigration on my own podcast. And in there I talked about, you know, people showing up, you don't know who they are, and they got to get insurance policies like to for, for people to be willing to let them integrate into the rest of the society. Otherwise, they're they're contained in a pretty tightly controlled area uh, until they can, you know, prove that who they are and and people sort of give them more liberty to walk around. Um, so the, yeah, I can, I can time together because yeah, one, one objection was like you were saying where people were worried it was going to be some sort of bureaucratic nightmare and just everywhere you're walking, people with clipboards would be holding out contracts for you to if sign. If you want to so cross one, this sidewalk, you need to sign these three yeah. pages, you know, for these three steps to get across the street. Yeah. Right. And so that's why the technology does address that, that, you know, no, it makes it a lot more seamless and less cumbersome. Um, some people thought it was like an infinite regress that like um like you can't just use contracts to determine who owns what because in order to sign a contract you have to know like who owns what going into it that kind of thing so there again yeah, yeah i was i was just clarifying it's not i'm not trying to say we all just sit down with and by writing stuff down we determine who the owner like there is a process of law and the judges make determinations based on, you know, we could call it the common law or natural law, things like that. Community norms would definitely all get involved there, but still whatever you, you think the right process is for determining who the rightful owner of something is, 
I don't see how instituting a monopoly state makes that process fairer or, you know, more just. And so that's kind of my my modest claim that I'm not saying my system's perfect. It's just if it's more organic and voluntary, then the outcome's going to be better. Right. Like you you brought up the idea of you've got different competing firms that are competing basically for the public's trust where it's like, oh, you're a member of that firm? I, I don't I don't really know. I mean, it's this, the same way if somebody were from uh, Venezuela or North Korea or something like that, you'd be like, oh, you know, you come from a totally different culture and way of doing things. I don't know if I trust you because you're from North Korea or whatever, whatever it might be. Pick some stereotypical place. Versus, you know, if you're from the United States and you travel the world, people are like, oh, you're, you know, you're from America, you know, like your money's really good here. And you'd have that exact same type of thing, but in more of a microcosm of like local municipalities and things. Yeah, right. That if the different companies had different reputations, that would certainly come into play. Um, also, too, just to give an example of like why competition would be so useful. So right now. If the police are accused of you know using excessive force in a situation, no matter how ludicrous the claim, like there could be video of some woman being handcuffed on the ground and cops kicking her in the face, and people will come in and defend the cops and be like, "Yeah, you don't have their job," you know, you know, and it's it's just insane. And but if it were a, a voluntary system where there wasn't just the police, but instead there were you know five different and. Uh, agencies or, or companies that had, you know, security personnel that you could hire in order to enforce the laws that the judges make, you know, right? It wouldn't be the same company making the laws and enforcing it. Those would be distinct operations. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, company A, their guy breaks some kid's arm when he's shoplifting. That would be bad for business. And the store owner could fire company A, you know, discontinue their contract and then bring in company B to run their security. And just, you know, and because B has a better reputation and, oh, yeah, in the last six months, there haven't been any reports of excessive force from their employees and it would just be better for business. It wouldn't be an all or nothing. Take it or leave it. Do you want law enforcement or not? It would just be no. Just like right now, if there's got options. Food, yeah, if there's food poisoning in a restaurant, you cannot go to that restaurant anymore. So the people say, oh, well, next time you're hungry, you know, don't come crying if you're against restaurants like the way they do with the police, <laughs> right. you know, so. Yeah, you know, that's good. It's uh, you you want there to be able to be if you know if the post office doesn't go, do a good job, you don't want it to be you get to the end of the chain and well you have no more options. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. You want there to always be some some recourse. I know the Constitution talks about petitioning for redress of grievances. Well, I mean, I know like the Constitution says we can do that on paper, but most of the time it's kind of like well, suck it up, Buttercup you you don't have you don't get to complain about that because there's no other option well they'll let you complain they just won't do anything about your complaints so. right right or they'll investigate themselves and find they did nothing yeah. wrong yeah after further review it turns out we didn't do anything wrong so right so that's the the point of having competition is that giving people a genuine exit option and then because they know that people do have that freedom it actually makes them better behaved in the first place Right. So just it puts the right incentives in place. I wrote this. Um, this was a long time ago, but I posted this on a Facebook group. But basically, like it, I, I'll post um, I'll pose some uh, situation to you. I'm curious how you respond. So essentially, let's say there's a society that's been functioning like this. There are different law firms or insurance companies that people subscribe to within this community. And there's like 20, 30,000 people in, let's say, central Texas somewhere. And then all of a sudden, like, and pretty much everybody, like 90% of the people subscribe to some, but there are also a few people that have like recently entered and they're like, I haven't decided yet, or I, I mean, I don't really like any of them, but, um, they're willing to deal with the extra scrutiny of, you know, not participating in that system, but they still live there and they have jobs and they know people. Um, and then in this hypothetical situation, let's say that's like one of those people that's not a member anywhere kills somebody and he says it was justified, but then you've got witnesses over here, which are part of this, uh, firm. And then a couple other witnesses over here, which are part of this firm. And one of the firms considers the death penalty and the other one doesn't. And the guy's like, Whoa, whoa you can't charge me because I'm not a member of either of those 
firms, like how would you go about solving that? Okay, so what's happening here is I think um, what you're saying is more of a natural question in the framework that like Murray Rothbard proposed. So yeah, he was kind of picturing it, and I think maybe David Friedman as well. So they kind of had a vision of people become customers of like private defense agencies and then those agencies. So it's like you got, it's like joining a bunch of gangs, but because it's, uh, you know, there's market incentives and whatever, the gangs are actually very well behaved and like war is costly and everything. And so in the major vast majority of cases, it's not that they just end up shooting it out in the streets. It just makes more business sense to sit down and, you know, just like crime families actually aren't at war often, and so if it's reputable companies and whatever, and they have shareholders, the, the argument's going to be they're going to be a lot more civilized. That's actually not the way I'm picturing it. So I'll, I'll answer your, I'll try to answer your question as best as possible, like the closest Bas thing in my Yeah, framework. basically, like how would you deal with people who want to participate in the society but don't yeah. want to pay for insurance? So, so there, again, like they wouldn't be um, – so my first pass is to say, I don't think they would have a lot of access. Like they wouldn't, I don't think somebody would hire them unless it was like just hiring day laborers to go work on construction or something. But like, I don't think they would be able to get a regular nine to five office job if they didn't have any insurance like that. Because again, I think if you had a clean record, you could just go buy it fairly cheaply. You know what I mean? Like statistically, most people are not going to kill someone at the work site. And so if the insurance company, you know, gives you a quick cursory investigation, they don't see any red flags, you're not going to have to pay a lot of the premium to have a million dollars in coverage in place for something like that. Um, so the, if somebody just would would refuse to do that, that would be a red flag. Like, what, what's the problem? Why, why aren't you willing to pay $100 a month or whatever it is? So it, it wouldn't even be that high. Um, so that's one thing. But then just say, okay, but something slips through the cracks or or there's a community that's more tolerant to that or old school. And they realize, Oh, people just, it's a handshake over here. And you know, you don't need to have insurance. And then somebody does kill somebody. Yeah. So what would happen if there really were extenuating circumstances, you know what I mean? Like the, like the one guy was insulting his wife and he was kind of drunk and it, it, he killed him. He wasn't trying to kill him. He was just trying to teach him a lesson and you know, that kind of thing versus someone's robbing a bank and shoots the teller. I mean, those are both homicide, but they're totally different um, kinds. So the insurance companies would have the ability to take that into account, you know, afterward, like if, if somebody want to take them on as a, as a client and pay the damage, and then this person has to pay them back over time, you know, you know what I mean? So there, even if you, but the, the way it would get convicted is like, it would go to a judge who was, so if there's the dispute, the way I'm picturing, like, forget the insurance companies. First, we have to figure out who owes whom what legally speaking. And then the fact that you have or don't have insurance would would, would matter. Um, and so, like, the, the guy's family who got killed in the bar fight would say to the killer, here's a list of 10 reputable judges who deal with cases of murder in this area. We're willing to take our case to any one of them, pick it because you know we're we're accusing you of murdering our dad, and then he would be able. To, and if he just said, "Oh no, those guys are all crooks," but they were clearly all reputable, then the community would know, and then the re community would respond in one way. And like at a certain point, you get to be uh, compelled to appear before a judge, even if you don't you don't agree to it or you don't like well, it. Well, so so no, so uh, sorry, I know I was thinking, but I, I just kind of had to make sure I got the framework across. But so finally, the punchline: you say, "Okay, sure, sure, sure." But no, some dude is going around killing people and he doesn't care what happens to him physically. Um, the way I handle it to, again, just bend over backwards to make sure we're not violating rights and it's all consensual is to say at that point, he's clearly a pariah. Um, I think, you know, the community would have mechanisms in place such that like people would track this guy around like to make sure everyone knows, you know what I mean? Like it would just be a public service. You know, people would chip in whatever is just like there could be a public park and fireworks every once in a while to have people whose job it is to do something like this. And then all the property owners in the vicinity would be notified that, hey, there's this guy on the loose. And they would all just say, you don't have my permission to be on my property. And so like no matter where that guy turned, all the landowners would say, no, not, you know, I'm not saying you got to go home. You just can't stay here. Right. It's so where would he be able to go? And in that 
in framework, I'm saying, I think there would be like an oasis. It would either be like a church, you know, like trying to reform wayward folk or just a for-profit business that we would say, oh, those are the prisons in that society. But it would be more like workhouses where you couldn't leave. And basically it would be on him to say whenever he was ready to be allowed to do anything or go anywhere, he would have to say, okay, I'm willing to be charged, you know, by this guy. Um, just, I can't take being cooped up in my house anymore or whatever. Oh, okay. So yes, you're jumping to what if he got back to his house before anybody interfered with his physical motion and now he's in his own castle. Yeah. I, I could imagine the legal, the structure being such that technically, um, if he stayed on his own property, you know, it would, it would be a vague, it, it would be less justifiable under the law to send armed men into his property to grab him and pull him out. Whereas it would be crystal clear that all the people surrounding him would say, you don't have permission to step onto my property. If you do, I'm going to have these people escort you off. It basically yes. would be like treating like him, like he's a foreign entity. Like if somebody from yeah. China comes to the United States, kills somebody and then goes back to China before we can catch him, you know, you either have to like get permission to go get him or say like, would you extradite him and hand him back over? Right, right. Yeah, you can't just unilaterally send your guy because you're violating Chinese sovereignty. So, yeah, I think it would be a similar thing here with the way the legal code would work. Um, So I think there'd be other cases, too. Like, what if somebody kidnaps somebody and then has the person chained up in his basement? There's there's a much more compelling case to send them in, you know what I mean? Because it's a stop at active crime in progress. But if it's a kind of thing where, no, what he did is already in the past and now we're just going to contain him, I, I could see it you know, being a situation where they just decide, you know, they, they watch him and everything just to say, no, we, he's not getting away, but you, we're going to technically wait till he comes out. Cause then it's just more, it just, it just reassures the community that we're not doing something inappropriate. Cause again, the community beware, if there's 10 different competing law enforcement agencies, that if one of them started getting more and more aggressive and cutting corners and do with it, like the community, would get, so the other ones might join forces to contain them. So they would not want to even give the appearance of overstepping their prerogatives. That's how I, and so those, so he could be tried in absentia. I think that's the, the with that Latin word, you know, they, they could have the court and say, Hey, if you don't want to show up and offer testimony in your defense, that's so be it. So they, you know, the, the accused, the, 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 would, the families of the victim it to where it's, yeah. his, it's to his advantage to even appear before somebody yeah. he doesn't So there would like. be. Up, if he didn't, if he just refused to show up, I think they would try him without him being there. If if it was an open and shut case, you know, he'd get convicted. So now there'd be like a standing judgment in that community saying, "Oh yeah, he owes their estate, you know, three million dollars." Or we're at least just waiting for some kind of a response, which just looks really bad. You know, it'd be like it's yeah. like running somebody trying to arrest you and you running away instead of being like, "No, I'm innocent. Go ahead, charge me." You know, I've got nothing to hide, mm-hmm. type of thing. So. Right. So, th- so that's how I think it would work. And then, like I said, those those workhouses, which might to us look like prisons there. It's not that. Oh, so the so the group grabs you and throws you in a cage. No, it's the property owners are saying you can't stay here. You're an outlaw. You're outside of our legal system. Right? You know, you've removed yourself. You, you're not allowed to be here. And then but those few places, again, whether they're like church base because they're rehabilitation or whether it's like a workhouse they would just say you can come here you know we're gonna we're gonna uh search you on the way in to make sure you don't have any weapons and you're you're not gonna have too many privileges <laughs> but you know we'll give you an internet connection we'll give you a work state you know depending on what your job skills are and you're paying us right we're putting you up but we're allowing you to work and you can still be integrated in the economy instead of like literally just having to leave the country which is like the only other option you have at this point. Right. Cause it's, it's either basically, you know, treat every single individual like they're a different country or you've got somebody essentially vouching for you and your reputation. Some people might be frustrated by the whole conversation. They're just like, why, why would you be thinking about this? Like what, like this is like such basic societal level stuff that's already been solved. And, and like, why why revisit it why why put so much thought into it okay so one thing is just the principle of it that i'm trying to come up with a way because right now the way the state operates it is not consensual 
at least not in the same way that other types of transactions are consensual in our society or, or are supposed to be um, that no, it's yeah, you can participate in elections or whatever, but the people in office right now, I do not approve of in any way whatsoever. And if I don't give them money to do things with that, I think are abominations, they will come and put me in a cell. And so that is not a just system. And then also just to give people a t an idea of the benefits that are possible, just to look at, you know, imagine if the government ran all the restaurants right now, or the government ran all the car companies and how awful that would be. And then if we opened it up to competition and private enterprise, you can just see how the quality would be so much better. The prices would come down, the service would be better. And so likewise, so if you wouldn't want to trust the government making your cars, why would you trust them with the ability to tell us who the criminals are and who gets to go to jail? Like that's the last thing you want to give over to the group of people that we all agree are the least moral in terms of professions. Like, you know, there's like, you know, used car dealers and lawyers and politicians or, you know, as the, as the cliches go. So it's a crazy system. And I think the reason most people just don't even bother going down this train of thought is they say, well, you got to have taxes because otherwise, how would you pay for the police and the military? And that's precisely what I was in grad school. These essays were trying to explain is, no, you could have voluntary provision of even judicial police and military defense. Wasn't there a, a famous case about that where it was, was it Germany or somebody that had like a monopoly on car production and are like famously produced one of the worst cars ever made because it was government, it was government run. I think it was the Soviet Union. I was, maybe it's the Soviets. And yeah. I can't think of what it wasn't the Yugo, right? Like I think the Yugo was a, but I don't think that's the car you mean. I can't think of what it is right now. I can't think of the name either. But I remember uh, seeing some video years ago about, you know, essentially that, where it's you've got central planners to make cars and it turns out you can't do it via central planning. There's got to be market forces at work to get a car. Well, and isn't, you know, if you had the option between um, having the ability to deal with somebody who kills somebody versus a car, like which one of those would you consider to be more basic in a civilized society? I would, I would consider the ability to remove people that are likely to kill you as more basic than a car. But we recognize when a car, you can't do it with a car, but then we say, well, no, but you have to have this system for dealing with people who kill other people. Right. And, and it's, it makes mistakes both ways that there are genuinely violent criminal people who don't get caught. You know, I'll speak in the United States, especially pretending, you know, certain regions of the country, it's just not safe. The police are not doing a good job protecting you from, you know, thieves and killers. There's just certain places people know, yeah, don't go in that neighborhood at night. You'd be crazy. Right. So that's basic failure of what the police says that, you know, what the government says, oh, we'll take care of that. Don't worry about it. And uh, so there's that element. But then on the other side, too, they throw a lot of people in jail for stuff that everybody knows is crazy. You know, like just ridiculous, whether it's literally like a victim. Marijuana paraphernalia. Crime. Yeah, like you didn't even have marijuana. Like you just had the stuff well, to smoke it if you wanted to. Yeah, so like that kind of, but also too, like the financial sector crimes, like where it's completely corrupt and, you know, everybody's doing insider trading. Like how, how could you even do business if you weren't in some sense trying to profit from inside knowledge? But yet, you know, they selectively prosecute people and take them out. You know, so Martha Stewart gets some ludicrous sentence or whatever, whereas other guys, you know, Nancy Pelosi's fine, even though like she's made some really surprisingly profitable trades in her day. Right. So anyway, it's just the system is crazy and it's not doing what it says it's going to do. And in every other area where we let markets work, they clearly outperform, you know, political provision of that service or good. And so the same things here. It's just, yeah, it's admittedly conceptually a little trickier to say, well, you know, how could there be a rule of law in a decentralized voluntary framework? Like that almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not, I argue. Do you think it's one of those cases of, you know, Jesus said, he who would lose his life will find it. He, he who would save his life will lose it. It's like, well, when you really give up control over the government and being able to force other people to do things, you actually become a lot freer when you give up that control. 
And funnily enough, you actually have a lot more control over those people. <laughs> right. To be, uh, to be productive in other words. Yes. I, I agree with that. And yes, the, like the urge for why is it that we want to have a police force and to have a strong, you know, military at the national level set like, Oh, we're worried of those bad people. Foreigners are going to hurt. And I would argue actually the U S government makes it more likely that foreigners are going to attack the U S and, um, and again, cause it's, it's hard to know what the counterfactual is that if people are picturing, Oh no, an ex the existing system, it's just the U S government only spends 1% on the military as what it currently does. Well then, yeah, maybe that wouldn't quite work, but a decentralized system where it would, it would be impossible to take over like, the current land mass of the U S if that was just filled with 400 million, you know, very productive people that had no taxes on them and, they, and they had no gun control and that, you know, it's just, th there's no way you could conquer that. Right. And they would have all kinds of sophisticated missile defense systems and blah, blah, blah. So, I'm just saying, and they wouldn't pose a threat to anybody. You know, no other country would be worried they were going to take them over. Like, remember how we just spent five minutes going over if some guy killed a guy in a bar and was in his house and how, yeah, I don't know if they'd want to go. With, like, that's how timid and conservative the system would be. So it'd be like a porcupine and on the, on the world scene that it wouldn't be aggressive externally, but everybody would know, oh, yeah, even though they're wealthy. It's better just to deal with them, just like Nazi Germany dealt with Switzerland, right? Like they could have just conquered them, but they said, "Why? Why? Why should we?" And so it's too expensive. These, these and also, people, they're gonna—they're not gonna touch us as we go conquer France right. and whatever yeah. all these other countries. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the other thing. I think sometimes people miss that is that the reason Switzerland is so, you know, uh, able to thread the needle and whatever is that yeah, it it could. I mean, because they also had a sophisticated like a. I had a, a Russian uh, political science professor was like in Switzerland. They have a t everybody has a tank in his garage or whatever. I can't do his accent, but it, they could put up a fight. You know what I mean? Like you'd get a bloody nose if you're the Nazis trying to roll in there. And like you say, the flip side is they don't need to force them because the Swiss famously like, oh yeah, we'll we'll take your gold. We don't we don't ask you questions where you got it. Okay, sure. So why would they? You know, and they're not going to attack them. They're not going to stab him in the back the way Stalin did, right? So that's the, um, that's right. That's the mentality. So, uh, this kind of, so the current Americans thinking, oh yeah, I don't like Joe Biden or I don't like Donald Trump, but we need to have the federal government to protect us from invasion. Is it? No, the current, you know, capabilities of Americans right now, if they were in a genuinely free system where they weren't fielding a Navy to go around the world, policing the world and everything, and they were just there to expel invaders that nobody would mess with that. I, I had this thought, I wish I could find this video, but this is kind of the last question that I have on the article. Um, I wish I could find this Jordan Peterson clip, but basically he says, sometimes you don't want to set too high of a standard for yourself because then you never actually go out and do anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's basically what your system is trying to address so many people don't feel like they have any kind of meaningful voice or vote in saying that they don't like the way things are run and they want, you know, at least some kind of limited option. Um, I was just thinking about the county that I live in. I think there's like 40,000 people that live here. There are two county judges for 40,000 people and they are up for reelection. I think it's every four years, two years or four years. And I feel like that that's not enough options. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar in uh, Exodus where um, Moses's father-in-law Jethro says like, why don't you have the people pick like judges for themselves of like tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you calculate that up. I, and I, I've heard different figures on how many Israelites there were, but some people estimate it was like 2 million people. Well, you're, you're talking about like electing uh, like over a hundred thousand judges for 2 million people. And it's like, that's a lot. And I think a lot of people would be like, oh, but you couldn't possibly train that many people to be good at their jobs. And I'm like, well, but so then the answer is to have two, you know, one judge for 2 million people. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. that plays back into the Jordan Peterson quote where it's like, we have such a, we feel like we need to have such a high standard. We actually are less able to judge ourselves and are less happy with the rulings that come down. 
Right. And also in the Israelite context, too, like to address your issue of well, how could you train that many and wouldn't the quality of the judges go down if you had too many? I think they had in mind, too, it's been a while since I've read that passage, but like a hierarchical, like the real easy cases, the, you know, the first layer of the judges could knock those out. But then if they, had, you know, if there was a situation like, oh, that's kind of tricky, let's kick it up a notch. And then it was finally like the, the, the toughest cases, they'd still bring to Moses and say, like, yeah, we don't know. We can't resolve this one. So there it's, it's you know, that kind of way too. like you don't need all the judges to be Moses. You just need more of them. And as long as they, you know, they got the, they got a good heart and they're trying to apply the law. Well, it really just it presupposes that the judges have a certain level of humility where it's like the biblical pattern is like the the defendant has no right of appeal. Like that that's that seems like such a no brainer to me. Why do we give the defendant the ability to appeal something? Of course, he's not going to like it if he loses. He's always going to appeal. When is he not going to take that option? Um, but in the biblical system, it's supposed to be the judge that says this is too complicated for me. I'm going to appeal this to a judge who knows more than I do. And I feel like not having that in our system is basically the root of a lot of these problems. Yeah, I think just to address the uh, the appeal issue, I haven't thought too much about that, and I'm not like a legal expert. So before I pontificate on, oh, here's how I think that would play out in a voluntary society, like I would like to understand it more in, in the real world right now. And then, I'd, but so, but the way I, th I think the appeal would be something like a judge would go ahead and give you, you know, you have a dispute with your neighbor. Hey, he stole my TV. He says, no, I didn't. He said, well, let's go to Joe Brown here. He's got a reputation for property theft and cases. And okay, sure. I didn't do anything. Let's do it. And we go and he rules away. And one of us is, thinks that's a travesty, you know, and especially if his opinion we think is ludicrous, you know, because he wouldn't just say, yeah, I find in favor of the defendant. Like he'd have to, you know, give an illegal opinion. And so I think what appeal would be is that you could take your, take that result and shop it around to some other judges. And if you could get a, a reputable, a judge who had a better reputation than the guy you went to. And, you know, we could talk about, well, how would that, you know, I think there'd be rating systems and we're like, it'd be kind of under just like mathematicians. The Better Business Bureau for judges, you know? Yeah. Like, like mathematicians can tell you who's a better mathematician, but they might disagree and quibble here and there, but it's, if some guy is in the top 10% of mathematicians, he's not going to be confused for someone in the bottom 10%. And so likewise with the judges, even them in their community, I think they would have a sense of, oh, yeah, those guys are sharp. And yeah, that lady, she's really good. No, that person. Eh. So I'm just saying if you took your result that you thought was a travesty and could get a more reputable judge to look at your case and say, I would be willing to retry this because I think this is wrong. You know, there could be that kind of a, a thing. And so then if the original guy refused to do that, that might be, you know, that would be the flip side of. If you accuse someone of a crime and they said, no, I'm not going to any judge. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what, whereas if you really, if your case was fine and you just have sour grapes, the other judges would look at it because it would, it would be a bigger deal to overturn another judge's ruling. And so that's, or it wouldn't even be overturned, but to disagree with, right? Because well, it's not, there wouldn't be this hierarchical system. Well, and also in the system that I'm thinking of, you wouldn't necessarily have to say, I'm going to give my opinion on this and I'm going to appeal it to the next person. He would say, I'm not going to. He would say, I'm not going to give a ruling on this because I'm going to kick it up to the next person. And he'll give a, you know, like, like what you said yeah. earlier, like, I don't even want to comment on this because I, you know, I'd prefer to kick it to somebody right. who knows more about it than I do. That's sort of the, the way that I'm thinking about it from a judge's perspective, which r would require a certain yeah. level of humility at the base level of, of right. judges. And I think you're, you're definitely describing what the Israelite system is. Yes. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, yeah, they like they weren't making any bones about. I mean, I guess they consented in the sense that the nation of Israel agree. You know, when they were in the spirit, they were agreeing. Yes, we will serve our God, and da da da. Thank you for rescuing. Us. And then they would backslide. But yeah, in my system, it's 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 more like one off, like trying to make everything consensually all along the way. Um, uh, and so it's a different type of thing. But yes. Um, I think what you're describing is exactly, and either way, you know, humility is obviously good and, but yeah, it's more necessary in, in your framework, the, the, you know, the, the biblical one, but again, the hope is they would have that extra sense of gravity in what they're doing because, oh, we're administering, you know, the, the law that God gave to Moses 
on Mount Sinai. Well, even for judges today, and I don't know if that's how much of an option is that for them to say, you know what, I don't want to give a ruling. Like uh, in the in the county here, there's like a murder that happened over a year ago, and they haven't brought it to court yet because the judges, they don't want to handle it, but they have to. And so they're just doing everything that they can to delay it and delay and push and push. And oh, it's wow. like, you know, wh why don't, do, ju do judges have a right of refusal of being like, I don't feel comfortable enough. I either don't think there's enough evidence or I'm not an expert in this. Can we give this to somebody? But it's like, nope, it happened in your jurisdiction. So it's, it's yours and you have to take it and you're the only judge that there is. So. So sorry. And that right there is a is a feature of the present system that I think is crazy. And that's why in mine, again, it's not that, oh, this alleged crime happened in this area. And so there the judge is, you know, John Smith. It's not how it would work. It was it would be you two have this dispute. See if you can find a mutually agreeable person. And, and, and that might and that sound be crazy to somebody people. from across the state, you know, but if they're better for the yeah. job and the person that's there locally doesn't want to take it, then right. why do they have to? Right. And and yeah, and I think the people, the judges would, it would be in their interest to maintain their reputation. So yeah, they wouldn't want to take on cases where they really know they're it just like consultants right now or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's or always like the ACLU will more... like, yeah, pick some case that they really, that they think that they can win, you know, some law firm. Mm -hmm. I mean, law firms do that. Why can't judges do that? It's interesting. Right. So in my sort of framework, they would. Yeah. Everything would be voluntary. And yeah, in the current system, yeah, I don't know if a judge can. I know they're supposed to recuse themselves. You know what I mean? Like if it's you're in a case where, oh, yeah, there's a conflict of interest here. So I'm I'm not going gonna to remove myself from from this case. But yeah, I don't know. Um well, I'm sure that that does happen in case, you know, if it was a family member of theirs or cousin or something. Yeah. Or like if they had business dealings with one of the parties or something like that. For sure. Well, that's so what do you want to. That's all I had for, for my end for the. OK, yeah. I was going to say, well, since we're talking about biblical justice and law, do you want to flip now and, and I'll ask you to explain your what your book is about? Uh, Sure. Yeah, I'd be I'd be glad to. Um, so yeah, the title of the book is called public stoning God's design for a nation without prisons. And, uh, it's basically a take on, um, what would it look like without prisons? I think I can make a pretty clear case why the Bible says that you're not allowed to have prisons. Um, but then also most people that have a prison abolition view take the side of, um, no death penalty. And I don't necessarily hold that view. So how would I, how would I fit the two of those together? And so the book is basically my attempt at doing that. Okay. So that's intriguing. And yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts because you, as you, you heard me, I should say, um, in my, just as a, as a postscript, I'm like the vision that I was painting for you. I do think very few people would end up in the workhouses that we would look at that and say, Oh, that's kind of like a prison, but it's real. Um, but they're just paying because, for what they did. They're not just sitting there, yeah, you know, eating right. up tax dollars. Right. But I, th I just think over time it would be more. And also, too, I think like if somebody killed somebody else, like the the ruling would be you're a lot, you know, to the heirs, you're allowed. You could go kill him if you want. And it's you're not going to be legally, you know, suffer damages or, you know, he can just pay you two million dollars if you if you for, you know, if you extinguish the, the, the you know, the, the debt. The, the life debt or whatever they would call it. And there is a biblical precedent for that. Um, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, interrupt your thought, but there's a precedent for that for, I think if it's, if somebody kills a slave, basically it's like a, you break it, you mm -hmm. bought it, you paid, you pay X amount for the slave. Um, but then also if it was like a negligent, I think the example that it gives, if somebody has an ox that was prone to goring people and he didn't keep it in. So it was negligent, but also he didn't kill the person mm -hmm. himself. Um, and then I think it just says, if a ransom is imposed on him, he shall pay. Uh, I think it's either as the judges determine, I can't remember the, the text. I remember it being kind of ambiguous, whether it's the judges that set that, or if it's, uh, his relative or family member. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just saying mine. Yeah. I think prison would actually shrink in most cases, which is be handled, um, through, I, I, I suppose though, like to make it more dovetail with what you're picturing, I could see if if people really thought like, no, when you take a life, you know, the community has to show you we don't we don't screw around. 
you know, th- that that could happen. I could see that being part of the law code that, no, you, if you're convicted of first degree murder, like they can kill you if they want to. Um, right. And it's yeah, a- I don't think many people would be sitting in prison. So, OK, so back to, to go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's a it's public stoning. It, it sounds super foreign to us, but I really think that it's it's um, quite compatible with the idea of voluntary society. Well, number one, because if you're going to have the death penalty, um, you want to have the authority of that be as decent- decentralized as possible. So it's not the judge that goes out and executes somebody. It's the means of execution is, well, number one, it's the witnesses, right? The witnesses cast the first stone and then the entire community. So basically the witnesses are saying, you know, it's on my reputation mm-hmm. that that we're doing this. And so... You can't just say, okay, yeah. I'm going to accuse this guy, but then I'm going to step back and I'm going to let the government agent, you know, chop off the guy's head. <clears throat> yeah, so that's fascinating because I think, yeah, the the initial recoiling of public stoning is that sounds sick. Like it sounds like we're, you know, a sadistic society that just, you know, gets some thrill of, of you know, the spectacle of, of killing a human being, you know, for sport. And you're saying that, no, it's the other way around. It's to make it more likely that if we are going to kill somebody. That it's not going to be abused by a centralized authority. Yeah. So it's the, basically the entire public has to agree. And if they don't, then by nature, you can't execute somebody. Right. Okay. But then so, um, I, I also think that the biggest, the biggest uh, thing going for it is that it's it's the only execution method that's designed to unnecessitate itself like every time it's listed that you're you know you're supposed to stone somebody it's that everybody will hear about this in fear and not do this again versus you know you uh give somebody a lethal injection behind closed doors and that's not really that scary versus public stoning well yeah the person's still dead but also it's designed to make it less likely that you're going to ever have to execute somebody else. Okay. So you're, I mean, I guess another way of saying it is you're saying the deterrent effect is a lot more potent, like given that you're going to kill somebody. Yeah. Doing it this way to, with a public spectacle is actually it's, it's, yeah, it's not like bread and circuses for the masses. No, it's, it's more instructive like to, to say, so, Hey, don't kill anybody. Cause this is what happens. Let's not screw around here. Right. No, yeah, that's a really good point that you mentioned. Um, there's actually prohibitions for gloating over it. You know, it's there's a law that says um, if you hang somebody after execution, you can't hang them up for longer than a day. You have to take the body down by nightfall. So there, I think that's put there as a guard, basically, for the authorities gloating over execution mm-hmm. to going too far. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Would it help if I just raise up? So, so, so first of all, just to clarify for the listeners, are you? Is this your own thing, or are you saying no? You you think this is what they had in ancient Israel, at least like under the time of the judges? Uh, what do you mean? Like, is it my own thing? Well, like, I'm, is I'm this... trying. I'm trying to make the biblical case for it, like how the Bible lays it out. So, like, I'm not inventing this. This is that's what I'm saying. Like, it's. You're saying you think this is what they did back at the time of judges? How often they did it is... It's a good model. Okay. Yeah. How often they did it is debatable, but I think I think it is a good model that we can draw some, uh, if not direct comparisons, then a whole lot more um, inspiration. Um, inspiration is not the, not the right word, but um, like a, a model, a template for us okay. to it, at least consider it, more. Okay, great. Yeah. And just, you just hit it out of there. So that's, that was my next question is just, are you straightforwardly just saying, this is what I think the ideal system is, or is it more, you're saying it sounds barbaric, but no, let's study it and see the wisdom involved. And then maybe we can take those insights to produce something that's more, that's a better system going forward, but not necessarily the exact same thing that they did. Yeah. Not necessarily the exact same thing that they did though. I'd I'd probably fall closer than a lot of people would be comfortable with falling, um, how, how close most people would fall to it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, you read through this stuff and most people just recoil and they don't really want to think about it. And, um, I used to ask my dad this question when I was little, why does everything that's so good for you taste so bad? Mm -hmm. How come donuts are, you know, everybody loves donuts. Nobody likes broccoli. 
I, I think mm. this is one of those broccoli moments in the Bible where it's like, you know, you're, you're going to find some really uh, deep, fascinating truths mm-hmm. by examining things that it's like, ah, I don't, I don't want to eat this. This is, this is disgusting yeah. to my palate. I actually do like broccoli, but I also like donuts. So um, <laughs> pick a food you don't oh, like and insert that there. Yeah. Okay. So if it, so it's okay if I just keep asking you questions like poking holes and sure. probing your, yeah. So objections are the best. Yeah. I mean, cause it's that I like that too. Like that's the best way to get somebody's viewpoint across, especially if you know, it's not a hostile objection. It's just trying to, okay. So one concern I could imagine people having is to say, you know, you're talking about, oh, the whole community has to agree, but actually isn't it well known that there is like mob mentality, like a lynch mob, and that a lot of times people get swept up in the crowd and do something because they're all reinforcing each other. Like, no individual would go and, you know, hang the black man for sleeping with the white woman. But if the whole crowd's getting all ginned up, it kind of, oh, well, you know, we all did it. There was the madness of the crowd. And so isn't there a danger of that kind of thing? Like, I think even uh, Mark Twain has a, I forget what one of his famous, not, I think they're, like, they're getting ready to do something. Maybe it even is literally throwing stones. Is it, do you know what I'm talking about? And where like each person doesn't think it's the right thing to do, but everybody else is doing it. So they kind of go along. Does that sound I'm not familiar? not familiar with Mark Twain. It's not familiar. Okay. But, but anyway. there, are, there are Bible accounts that I can think of um, that went both ways. So there was, um, you know, there's, conviction of somebody in the absence of evidence because you got you know fake witnesses making up Mm -hmm. charges um there's an account of that i think the guy's name is naboth basically the ruler said hey i really want this guy's vineyard and um his wife jezebel says well why you know why are you so sad why don't you just tell some guys to say that they heard him blaspheme and then charge him with that put him to death and then now his field's yours so he does that they they execute the guy for blasphemy and then they're like hey you know congratulations you've got his property now um but then you've also got the opposite where um i think it's king saul tries to put his son jonathan to death because he took some rash vow and said nobody's going to eat until we win this battle well his son didn't hear of it he ate some honey and then Saul says, okay, well, it's time to kill you because, um, I said, whoever eats anything before we win our next battle is going to die. And all the people come in and say like, nope, Hey, you, we're not going to let you do that. Well, number one, because they're the means of execution. So they get to say no. So in that Mm -hmm. sense, you've got nullification working within that Mm -hmm. system just fine. Okay. Um, In that system, is is capital punishment reserved for a particular? Like, because I think there's a lot of stuff in, I don't know if it's Deuteronomy or Leviticus, but that call for the death penalty from our modern sensibilities, we would say, whoa, that's 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 not a capital offense. Yeah, I actually um, part of the project of putting the book together is I went through and I I made a list of every death penalty in scripture. And, uh, it's all, I've got it all organized by category and put in a spreadsheet. And there's some stuff in there. Like if the, uh, one of the sons of Aaron doesn't wear the linen undergarments when he goes in to serve in the temple, well, then it says that God's going to, you know, kill him or strike him dead. Or, um, Mm. or if you make imitation, holy anointing oil, then you're supposed to be put to death and that type of stuff. There's a lot of things. I honestly don't know what relevance that that would have. Um, Mm -hmm. There's, I, I, I'm in the process of going through and addressing each one of those five, you know, you know, five, 10 minutes on each one of those. Um, but there's some other things in there. It's like, oh, murder. Okay. Yep. Or, um, you know, sleeping with an animal or, um, kidnapping somebody, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things where it's like, oh, yep. I can see a pretty clear one-to-one correlation there. And then there are some things where it's like, yeah, I don't even, I don't know anybody who's a priest of Aaron. (laughs) What, right. How would that work? What would that look well, like? Well, I think one that occurs to me, isn't it like if if, if a kid like mouth, I don't remember what the exact verbiage is, but mouths off to his parents. Yeah. But if, them, I had heard that they actually never, like nobody ever did that. Yeah. Not that we have record of from everything that I've, hmm. I've looked into, but yeah, if it was, it was, uh, it literally says in the Hebrew, if a child speaks lightly of his parents, then he's supposed to be put to death. 
And actually that um, Jesus quotes that condemning the Pharisees for not practicing that in Mark, I believe it's Mark seven, nine through 13. Jesus says, um, you know, Moses said, if anyone reviles his mother or father, then he shall be put to death. But you say you allow him to dedicate, you know, whatever should have been reserved for his parents. You allow him to dedicate that to the temple and you nullify Moses by doing that. So basically he says, you guys ignore Moses. You don't stone rebellious children. You encourage them in their rebellion. So that's, there's an example there of Jesus actually condemning the Pharisees for not upholding that one. Now, okay. So that's an interesting one. I th- I always thought he was, he was more pointing out their hypocrisy. Like, I think it was more like you guys are just inventing stuff and you're not even following what's clearly written. Right. As opposed to, I'm really upset that I see some kids mouthing off here and I would like to see them murdered or not murdered, killed because murder implies it's unjust. And I, is, are, you, are you okay with that? Or you think that, no, he actually really was looking around saying, guys, rules a rule. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Well, he, he, his condemnation is, well, you like this part of Moses. And so mm-hmm. you add, you know, more restrictions to it because you're like, oh, well, this is really important. So we should, we should ramp up the requirement here. And so he, You'll do that in one area, but then this other area, you'll say, well, you know, if a kid wants to, you know, not support his parents in their old age that, you know, that's okay. Um, because, well, they're doing it for God, you know, they're doing it for, to dedicate stuff to the temple. So I think, um, you're, I think it's both. Um, Mm -hmm. you've got basically the Pharisees playing fast and loose with parts they like and parts they don't like, and he's using that to show their hypocrisy, but the passage that he uses is the one about, you know, children reviling or cursing their parents what a, so how do you like do, is there some big f- purpose in your mind of not having prisons like is is that a like a very nice benefit of this that we don't have to have this whole apparatus of a prison industrial complex and everything that's just nope the legal system is where it is it's very might you might consider it to be brutal or harsh but it's very efficient and we just move on and they're committing a crime you deal with it on the spot and boom you're done yeah, I think um, that's the biggest thing. It's also the thing that I think makes the title of the book a bit more palatable. Um, mm-hmm. I can't just focus on like the death penalty, like that's not an right. interesting book, but the the benefit of um, d- working through the death penalty and how it worked and how God intended it, what the ideal is supposed to be, um, the benefit of that is that you would have no prisons. And okay. n- like n- you would only... You would have no prisons, but also I think it's it's very clear to me that the, they're straightforwardly prohibited, like you're not allowed to have them. And so that's why the public stoning has some kind of value as a deterrent and punishment. I'm trying to remember, there were lesser things too, right? Like that you that you would have to, if, if you did something wrong, you'd have to compensate the person. Like it wasn't just every wrong thing, you got killed. Right. Yeah, the the death penalty is obviously the most severe thing, and it's not the only thing that you need to completely replace a prison system. You've got um, like lawful forms of slavery. You stole something, and you don't have a, anything to pay it back with. So a judge assigns a value to your labor, and you work until it's paid back. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know, you work in the kitchen if you couldn't pay for your meal and you forgot your wallet, type of thing. Um, but you've also got uh, corporal punishment, um, marriage restrictions and mandates, um, restitution you steal something there's different levels depending on what was the attitude of the thief when he stole there's more egregious forms of theft Um, like if you steal something and then you feel bad about it and you turn yourself in well then you restore whatever it was plus a 20 percent penalty Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. versus if you stole something and then you're caught with it well then it's double and then the worst level is you steal something and then you dispose of the property. You either sell it or destroy it. Then it's a four times or a five times penalty. Mm-hmm. And I suppose the famous eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, yeah that would be, I guess, within the realm of uh, corporal punishment. Um, so there's also verses in there that'll say something about uh, if you cause, if you injure somebody and cause him to like lose time at work, then you've got to compensate him for his time lost in working. Um, but like if you, you chop somebody's leg off, well then your leg should be chopped off. Okay. So 
I guess the last thing I'll ask you, and they'll probably run the clock out here because it's a big issue. Couldn't you imagine a Christian saying, yes, that was the system for the Old Testament, but Jesus famously said, you know, you have heard it said an eye for an eye, but we're supposed to love our enemies and be all about forgiveness and and so forth. And so um, that it doesn't, didn't, Jesus somehow show us to move beyond that simple system of retribution, which yeah may have served its purpose at the time, but you know, Moses gave us the law, but Jesus gives us the gospel. Yeah. I love that question. Um, and I think a lot of people are under the impression that Jesus did away with the law. He didn't do away with it. He offered it's the satisfaction for its requirement. Um, so like an example of turn the other cheek, well, according to the law, like if I were to slap you across the, across the cheek, well, then what does, what does Moses say is supposed to happen to me? You get slapped back. Right. I, I would get slapped like eye for an eye. Right. Mm-hmm. But so let's say I slap you across the face and then you offer you your other cheek. What, what are you doing? Like you're offering to suffer the consequences that should fall to me. Mm-hmm. Right. So Jesus is offering the satisfaction of the, of the law. He's not saying if somebody slaps you on the cheek, act like it never happened for, you know, forgive them by acting like it never happened. The way that you forgive somebody is by offering to suffer again for a wrong that was done against you. And we see that modeled perfectly in Jesus's life. Jesus wasn't at fault for, you know, mankind's falling away and doing evil. Mm Mm-hmm. And, but so what does he do? He, he suffers again. He's already suffered loss. He's, but he's like, you know, you're my lost sheep. The sheep stole itself from his master. And now the masters could either cut his losses and say, well, I guess he's just going to die. He's going to fall off a cliff or get eaten at some point. He says, uh, no, I'm going to, I've already suffered loss. I'm going to go to work to regain what was lost. So it's the, the willingness to, to suffer again. For something that was done against you okay i i love all that stuff but then again so doesn't that bring us back okay so if you're saying how we should implement this going forward or have some version of it incorporated some guy robs a bank and shoots the bank teller we're gonna stone him right it's not that the community is gonna stone somebody else to take on his sins and so right and with so how does that most capital punishment things you're prohibited from offering a substitute for a murderer Mm -hmm. right that's that's obviously strictly put in there um what should repentance look like for a murderer everybody's probably familiar with the story of um, zacchaeus who had been um, given authority by the romans to tax people and they would famously take a lot more than they were supposed to which rome was like well yeah that's your pay um, hmm. whatever you can get at more out of people than what, you know, you need to turn around and give to Caesar. Um, so Zacchaeus, I don't think he made up the number of like, well, if I've defrauded anybody, I'll restore fourfold, whatever I've done. I don't think he made that number up. I think he was, I think he had a uh, scripture in mind that says, if you hmm. steal, steal money from somebody and then you dispose of it, you owe quadruple. Uh, mm-hmm. Jesus didn't say, oh, Zacchaeus, you're thinking of Moses. He says, salvation has come to your house. Like you want to do what the law says you're supposed to do to pay for that. Mm-hmm. And so if Zacchaeus, if Jesus commends Zacchaeus like that for stealing something, repenting, wanting to do what, what, uh, what, what, uh, the law says you're supposed to do after you've done something wrong. What should we expect from a murderer? What would repentance look like for a murderer? Well, the problem is no matter what they do, they can't bring the person back that they killed. Right. Um, Whereas with other types of crimes, you know, you could maybe compensate somewhat. Um, So, yeah, I I don't like in a in a biblical sense, I think you'd say, oh, you you acknowledge that you're deserving of hell and you put your faith in Christ and you realize that he took his sins upon himself and that's why you got forgiven. But in terms of like a secular legalistic concept, I I guess the two observations are nothing he can do can bring the person back and killing him per se doesn't help anybody. 
except for like a sense of vengeance. Whereas if the guy's genuinely contrite and you can tell like, yeah, I'm really sorry I did that. And I, I, there's nothing I can do to make it up to you. I, I'm so sorry. Like I could see the people thinking, well, if we forgive him, then we can move on with our lives too. You know, that kind of thing. Well, this, um, there were some people that accused the apostle Paul of, you know, saying things and blaspheming and all this stuff. And, um, mm-hmm. they took him to court before Rome and, and Paul's attitude was, um, if what they're saying is true, I don't, I don't seek to escape the death penalty. Like that was Paul's attitude. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's something that you should expect from a murderer. He's like, you know, what, whatever you guys want to do to me, I'm not, I'm not going to try to run and hide and say that I didn't do it. You know, but I throw myself at your murderers mercy. that Paul was a, Saul was a murderer, right? Yeah. And yeah. they didn't kill him they well said, the jews well, he wouldn't he have accused him of that the jews wouldn't <laughs> no, have no, accused him of that because they commissioned him to go out and uh execute right Christians. but i'm saying um how did god use him he didn't say hey, everyone this is a good example stone him to show us you know i'm serious when i said don't commit murder or thou shalt not kill that no he used him and presumably i think like because saul once he realized what he had done and that jesus was lord and everything like the magnitude of that like that's perhaps why he he was such a great epistle writer and had so much energy is like because in his mind you know oh wow because like, he deserved to die and it's like well right that's a mo- that's a motivator right there <laughs> right, right like to get someone to really understand the gospel and to realize it's not because of our own merit like we know we do not deserve this grace mm-hmm. and who better to grab than somebody who had been persecuting you know so so that's anyway um, yeah, so anything that anybody wanted to throw at Paul, Paul's like, yep, I'm I'm guilty of worse than that. Right. I already right. acknowledge. And that really made, I think that made him such a powerful teacher. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, I mean, I'm just kind of repeating the question just from a different angle, but can you understand why some Christians might hesitate and say, like, like I'm not, I, I know it's you know some christians debate about capital punishment just in general let alone having public stoning um i suppose maybe that we if we focus on that for a second so i think you're a much uh people would have less ability to argue with you if you were going to say let's put aside the question of should some crimes be punishable by death given that we we are going to have some then yeah the the public stoning is a much better way of administering that than having somebody sit in a cell for 10 years appealing and blah, blah, blah. And then we, we inject poison into his arm after giving him a, a big last meal. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's difficult. And, and I don't want to just say like, well, if you, you know, the cop out answer I think would be, well, if you don't want the death penalty, well, then you've got to have something that, that you do with people. There's got to be some consequence. Mm-hmm. It's not just a, oh, well, he said he's sorry, so I guess we're going right. to let him right. go. Um, right. I think most people agree that that's not tenable, um, or I guess that that is untenable. I don't know if tenable is a word for whatever reason. I think it is. Uh, uh, maybe it is. There's there's something I think, like I think both ways you said that would work. So. Okay. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of the word uh, inept. Uh, apt is not a... Yeah, <laughs> it's not a it's not an alternative there. Oh, excuse me. Um, but yeah, the death penalty. I think there's some really strong um, correlations in the New Testament to that, essentially being um, excommunication, mm-hmm. um, which really pushes it. And I and I do explore this towards the end of the book. Um, what I, I really feel like there should be a society where somebody is. Uh, the society is held together by people saying, you know, I, if I go off the rails in a certain way, I want you to come kill me. Um, Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, any nation or society is really held together by that kind of understanding that, and and people acknowledging that and not just saying, well, if you go off the rails, I'm going to get you, but also turning it back around on themselves and saying, if I go off the rails, I want there to be people around that come get me. Well, yeah. You know, what's interesting is you're saying that, is I think right now the reason a lot of people hesitate and they wouldn't want to say that is because they don't trust the legal system. They're worried that they could be falsely convicted of homicide when they didn't actually do it. 
Right. Whereas we, we spent a lot of time it, talking about that. Yeah. Right. Whereas I, yeah, I do think I agree with you. If, if the system were, and you have already talked about in this discussion about why you think your method, it would be, there'd be a much lower likelihood of a false conviction. Um, that, yeah, I think a lot of people would be willing to say in the front end, oh yeah, if I like clearly, if I somehow become a serial killer, then oh yeah, put me out of my misery. Like I want you to, you know, I could totally see someone saying that. And so then it's just, you know, pulling it back a little bit and you can get more specific. Like, well, how would I have been in the position of killing somebody? You know what I mean? Are you just talking about like I'm driving and a kid was running across the street and I didn't see him? Well, that's not first degree murder. You know, so yeah, we don't mean that. We mean premeditated, you know, some guy is sleeping with your wife and you decide you're going to kill him. You can't do that. You know, that kind of stuff or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. And I think the most people's objection to like a libertarian or um, anarchist version of things is like, well, the only reason you're thinking that direction is because you want to like shun accountability and you don't want other people mm-hmm. telling you what to do. And I'm, I've thought about how do you go the opposite direction? Like how do you lean into accountability? And it's funny studying these laws made me start asking those questions. It's like one of those questions you don't ask until you've eaten your broccoli, that you've pushed past Mm -hmm. the hard questions. And at the end of the day, my frustration has been, well, okay. So if I wanted to become more accountable, because I think there's a lot of things that are lax, like adultery and, or blasphemy, you know, things like that, or Mm -hmm. cursing parents, whatever. What if I wanted to more accountability in those directions? Like, where would I go? Who would I talk to? And there isn't anybody. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, that's in one sense, a um, comfort that I'm holding myself to what I would consider a relatively low standard, but is higher than what most people would mm-hmm. think of mm-hmm. as being expected of them by society. Uh, and I think, oh, so now I just need to be on the lookout for somebody who would be willing to hold me accountable to those things. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's where would I find you know, such a person. Cause you know, nobody at my church, my pastor thinks I'm crazy. Um, why, you know, why would you want somebody to come after you in case you curse, mm-hmm. started going around cursing your parents and things like that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think we could kind of link the two discussions because <clears throat> remember I was saying, you know, Oh, so some random guy shows up and he wants to work at my company. It's an office job and he'd be coming in and out interacting with 30 different coworkers and he's, you know, I said, well, where are you from? And he's like, you know what? I come from this region over here on the trip over. Someone robbed me. I have no papers. I can't prove to you who I am. You're just going to take my, eh, well, can you get in show? And you can't, but what if he said, I'll sign whatever paperwork we need for your legal system, agreeing if a reputable court convicts me of, you know, embezzling from you or assaulting one of my coworkers or da, 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 you can kill me. You know, and so there, like, can you trust me? You know what I mean? Like, if I'm willing to say, you know what I mean? And and he and that guy would be, you know, maybe over time, then they would change the deal to then, you know, once he'd gotten a bunch of paychecks under his belt, maybe he'd switch to the more standard thing of here, I'll post a two hundred thousand dollar bond. But in the beginning, for sure, you know, I mean, if he was willing, because, again, so somebody knowing how the legal and that's why it would be so important to have a fair legal system where. Yeah, if you really are a law-abiding person, you can't just get convicted of a triple murder that you had nothing like this is not going to happen. Um, so th- there you could do something like that just to kind of vouch for yourself and everyone would be like, whoa, this guy's not screwing around. Well, okay, yeah, you start next Monday, sure thing. No, I, you bringing up that example reminded me of the end of uh, Andor season one, the Star Wars thing. But basically that mm-hmm. season one ends with the char- uh, one of the characters being like, I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm into the rebellion. I'll do whatever you want. And they're like, you know, well, we were about to come kill you because we don't, we don't think we could trust you and you've got too much information. And he's like, well, that was one of my stipulations was, uh, if you don't let me join, then you're going to have to kill me. And it's like, oh, okay, Mm. well, yep. We all trust each other now. Great. Like we can move forward based on that. And I thought that was a really interesting way for them to end the series and just kind of like. I realized my, some of my own thoughts were, were sort of validated because it was such a, a, a cathartic moment at the end of the, at the end of the first season. Well, for sure. I think, are you picturing it like this that, yeah, guys, I know it sounds crazy. Just like 
I can understand my proposals would strike most people as absolutely nuts. Like you're going to have competing judges and police age. What are you nuts? That's it wouldn't work. I get it. I know how nutty that sounds. So likewise, are you saying you guys are picturing that every 38 minutes, somebody's getting stoned and we're all getting hauled out of school and work to go stone somebody. And no, it's in a community that really was committed to this ideal or this framework. It would be very rare for someone to kill somebody like, you know, to murder, to be a murderer. And so th this would not happen very often. And it would just be more like this standing system that everyone kind of just knows. Yeah. Don't do that. Cause you know, we, we don't want to have to stone you, but we will. Right. And I think, I think, um, everybody's initial reaction is the thing that gives me confidence that it would work better because everybody's kind of like, whoa, that's really drastic and disturbing. And I'm like, that's the reason that it's given. Right. It's counting on it being disturbing and, and, uh, people not wanting to do it, but it tells you to do it anyway. You're not going to want to do it. It's mm -hmm. going to make you, it's going to disturb you and make you afraid mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Yep. And that's okay. by design. And that leads into, so what, what's your take? Because I've heard a lot of, not a lot, I've heard reputable people, though, arguing that they didn't, I think I asked you this before, but then I forgot. Um, I don't know if we, if we got interrupted or if we got sidetracked, probably I interrupted you. But can you just speak more to the issue of, in practice in the Israelite system, uh, that a lot of those things weren't, like, for example, I know I didn't bring this up. Um. Meaning that, yeah, they knew those were the penalties, but in practice, they often didn't pull the trigger. Like, you know, Right. Well, the that. witness requirement standard is pretty high. You have to yep. have two or three witnesses who, if they're found to be lying, are executed. Okay. But so. for example, with um, Joseph, you know, Jesus, uh, what, foster father, stepfather, what do you call him? Um, you know, he's betrothed to Mary, and then she ends up pregnant. He knows he's not the father. And it says, you know, being a just man, he was going to put her away quietly. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always thought that was interesting. Like, isn't he technically supposed to get her stoned? Right. But he's only one witness. You need one more person that would be willing to testify to that effect. And then other than that, if you don't have two witnesses, you, you keep your mouth shut. And so I think in that sense, that kind of goes to the other extreme where people are like, mm -hmm. whoa, that's way too high for you to ever be able to convict a murder. You you know, you mean somebody could see a murder in broad daylight and have a video of it and everything. And if nobody else is convinced by that video evidence enough to be willing to testify and put their life on the line, then we're just supposed to let the guy go, even though you have a witness. And I'm like, yeah, that's how mm -hmm. that's the standard. You've got to have at least two or three witnesses. And if you don't have two witnesses... If you only have one person who witnessed a murder and can I positively identify the guy and all the evidence matches, mm -hmm. that's not, that's not enough. You need two people. So th I think that's a higher standard of evidence than we currently have. Mm -hmm. And people seem to be relatively comfortable with the way things work right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have no problem with what you just said about the, you know, the having the high threshold. I just, for what it's worth, my take reading you know, the New Testament accounts of Joseph and what his decision was. I didn't think it was that he thought, oh, yeah, I really ought to get her stoned. It's just it's only my word. You know, and technically, wouldn't she agree if he said, hey, everyone, can you? You know, I guess she wouldn't be agreeing that she committed adultery. Um, so a anyway, I, well, I just obviously felt it was more it, there's like some merciful on his part. There's some yeah. miraculous stuff being caught up in there. And that night, obviously, an angel told Joseph, like, she, right. you know, she didn't cheat right. on you. This is, you know this offspring of the Holy spirit and all that stuff. But, but also, I guess, yeah. Also like the scene when, um, you know, they, they drag the woman caught in adultery before Jesus and say, the law says we should stone her. And then he famously, you know, says, let him without sin cast first stone. Even there, I get the, the feel of that is that they were putting on a spectacle like for him. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't that normally, Oh yeah. They're grabbing adulteresses out in the street and stoning or stoning them, you know, every other week or something. You got the sense that this was kind of a contrived thing that they were doing like, oh yeah, you know how the law says this? Let's go grab her and see what this, you know, so you can trap Jesus on this one. Yeah, but well, I, I give more detail on this in the book, but um, I, I got to preface my answer with saying that um, 
that passage is not found in any copies of the Gospel of John until the year 400. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you, I know that I would, there is some I, dispute over that one. I think you can conservatively say that, okay, well, uh, well, I guess the more conservative thing would be to assume that it's not scripture. I mean, it's like right. you got a puzzle with an extra piece in it, essentially, but you don't know if right. it's an extra piece or not. So giving everything the benefit of the doubt, uh, I still think you should err on the side. Pe I'm not saying you specifically, but people should err on the side of the passages that we know are authoritative versus that's like the passage that most people hang their hats on. And it's right. got one of the most dubious, dubious um, mm -hmm. uh, authenticities of any passage in the New Testament. So with that out of the way, I think um, I could make an argument that Jesus is upholding the witness requirements. He says, okay, well, if she's guilty of adultery, let, you know, the witnesses throw first. Like, let, let the guy who's not involved in adultery with her cast the first stone and they all leave. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, where are your accusers? He doesn't say, you're not guilty or you don't deserve death. He says, where are you? Where are the witnesses against you? And she says, there aren't any. And he says, well, you can't, you can't have a case without witnesses. So that's the, that's the angle that I would tend to, to take on that on that account there. Okay. Yeah. That's incidentally, I wasn't bringing it up to as a knockdown against yours. I was bringing it up not for what Jesus did, but for the, it doesn't literally say this, but I, I'm just saying the feel of that to me was these guys were not in the habit of normally dragging women out into the street to stone them, that this was a, a, a production to trap Jesus. And right. That and where's the guy? An Why did they thing? just bring the girl out? If right. she was right. caught That's in the it. act, well, it takes two to tango. So where's the guy? Why did they didn't, why didn't they bring him? So that, that right there gives you the clue. It's kind of a kangaroo court. Right. Right. Okay. Well, uh, interesting stuff. I get, is your book on Amazon? Yep. It's on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, wherever you want to, uh, wherever books are sold. It's just, it's called public stoning. God's design for a nation without prisons. Okay, and it's Adam Terrell. Yeah, uh, it's pronounced Terrell. It rhymes with Carol. Terrell. Okay, Adam Terrell. I like okay. to say it's uh, spelled like Terrell Owens, the football player, but it's pronounced the white way. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, well, thanks. This has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, I, there's a there's a, quite a bit of crossover uh, in our philosophies, which I find refreshing. Yeah, definitely.